for uh, finding time to attend this event. My name is Mara Iroldi. I'm a lecturer in economics and public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government. And I have the privilege of chairing this uh, event, which aims to present Sir Michael Barber's book on how to run a government so that ta citizens benefit and taxpayers don't go crazy. And Sir uh, Michael uh, has been leading uh, the delivery unit of Tony Blair for many years, and then he's uh, advising several governments on how to learn from his experience, and he's a world-leading expert in uh, large uh, system reforms, and especially in education reforms. He will speak, he agreed to speak for about 15 minutes about the book, which, uh, by the way, you will have a chance to buy and have signed after the events. Uh, Michael agreed to stop and, and sign book and have further uh, quick informal conversation after uh, the debate. We have uh, Professor Christopher Hood, a world leading scholar in uh, government and uh, also publishing uh, books on uh, how to run government better. So we will have an interesting exchange of views. And we have Professor uh, Bevan. A, policy, a professor of policy analysis at the London School of Economics uh, who has been director of the Commission for Health Improvement. Uh, where he went over the dark side and started believing in targets and terror, or naming and shaming. <laughs> uh, both Professor Wood and Professor Bevan are visiting professors at the Blanty School of Government. And uh, I will uh, stop here. With no further ado, I let Michael introduce his book. Okay. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, thank, you all, thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, I feel uh, very privileged to be uh, with all of you and with um, this very distinguished panel and to be um, uh, in this event anyway associated with the Blavatnik School of Government, which I think is going to be a world, it already is, but will become a world leading institution in this whole field. Um, I'm going to speak for, uh, as Mara said, for about 15 minutes and then um, Christopher and uh, Gwyn are going to respond and then please feel free to ask anything, debate anything, um, uh, that would be fantastic. But I want to begin by telling you a story you probably already know. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? He's in prison and the Pharaoh has a dream. The Pharaoh dreams that there are seven very fat cows and then seven very thin cows and he wakes up and he says to the court, what does this dream mean? And they, they say, we don't know. And then one of them says, we don't know at all, but there's this bloke in prison who's really good at dreams, let's get him. And they drag Joseph out of the prison, they throw him on the floor in front of the Pharaoh and they say, what does it mean? The Pharaoh says, tell me what this dream means. And he says, it's very clear what this means, Pharaoh. You're going to have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine, so you need to prepare. During the seven years of plenty, you need to save the corn year on year on year. Um, and then when the famine comes, you'll be prepared. And the Pharaoh says, that is absolutely fantastic. It's all in the Old Testament, almost in these exact words. Um, that's really fantastic. And I know you're only 30, Joseph, but I'm putting you in charge of it. I want you to get out of the palace. Don't hang around here. You can have my second best chariot. Go on, get out there and put somebody good and true in charge of every region and district of Egypt to gather the corn and then count the corn as it comes in. So off Joseph goes and the seven years of plenty come and it says this in the Old Testament in the, in the King James Version, after the third year, he's been counting the corn, after the third year there was so much corn it was without number and they stopped counting. And then the famine comes and they don't give the corn to the people of Egypt, they sell it back to them, they don't want any welfare dependency in ancient Egypt. And having uh, sold it back to them, then all the people from surrounding areas where the famine spreads far beyond Egypt, they're coming, including, as you remember, in the end, Joseph's father, Jacob. And uh, so not only do they sell the corn back to the Egyptian people and keep them healthy and well, they solve their balance of payments problem. 14 year strategy. Uh, this is um, a brilliant story of delivery. Joseph uh, interprets the dream, dream, which nowadays we'd call a treasury forecast. Uh, he, sa he, doesn't, he doesn't say an end to boom and bust. He says, you're going to have some seven good years and then seven bad years, so prepare during the good years for the bad years. And then the Pharaoh completely gets it and sets up a delivery chain. Pharaoh, Joseph, the people in every region, the people in every district, a trajectory, 20% of the corn a year for seven years above baseline but you don't need to count when you're so far ahead of trajectory. Uh, and he remembers that to run a country, 
you don't sit around in the palace being pampered. You get out there. That's why he gives Joseph his second best chariot. There it is, a perfect example of deliverology in the Old Testament uh, that ancient Egypt uh, taught us back then, but gets too rarely applied. And actually, modern Egypt could really do with Joseph or somebody like that. Um, so I want to just quickly, in the next few minutes, take you through the processes that I set out in the book uh, that are about uh, bringing about effective delivery. And what, in writing the book, what I was trying to do is make it interesting, if possible, to the general reader, not just the academics, although hopefully interesting to the academics, not just the government insiders in the civil service or ministers, although hopefully interesting to them, but interesting to people who are interested in politics and government and how government works and might work better, because actually government, the quality of government is a major issue of our time. I'd say it was one of the big moral issues of our time. Uh, one of the things that's become really visible um, in a way that I don't think it was even 15 years ago is just how important effective government is. You saw it tested during the financial crisis, but also in extreme places like Syria and northern Nigeria, uh, Somalia, you see what happens when government collapses. Uh, and so getting government to be more effective is a major uh, uh, ethical, moral challenge for the 21st century. Uh, not just in those uh, failed states or, or fragile states, but also in uh, places like this, where if government is run better uh, and uh, citizens get better outcomes for uh, the same amount of tax or better outcomes for less tax and debts get paid off, that's good for us. It's good for people, people to flourish and it's good for future generations. So the effectiveness of government is a major issue. And what you see um, too often around the world is actually a growing cynicism about government, a growing sense that government isn't very effective, uh, that actually that is a big problem for a lot of people. They're cynical about politicians, they're cynical about government. And it's one thing to be uh, critical of a governing party and vote them out or not. Uh, it's another thing to be cynical about government in general, and it's another thing again to, for that to generate into a cynicism about democracy and about how government could work. And you see, even in parts of uh, Europe now, a growing scepticism about whether government can be effective. Places where you would never have thought that that would occur. If you remember, it's only about six weeks ago that um, France was breathing a sigh of relief that Marine Le Pen only came second in that election. But 30 years ago, that would have been unthinkable. So, it's a big issue. Um, and if you could make government more effective, uh, it would be a really good thing for not just for government, not just for any particular government, any particular time, but for government in general. And in the book, I've tried not to argue for a particular kind of government, but for broadly for for governments that want to do good, depending on what their view of, uh, uh, of good is, how to be effective. And it doesn't matter whether I argue in the book whether you want small government or big government. Actually, effective government is really important. I open the book with a debate about modern India. Uh, in the run-up to the Modi election, there was a debate between Amartya Sen and Jagdish Bhagwati. Bhagwati saying more of the 1991 reforms are what's required. Amartya Sen saying we're not doing enough about equity. Neither of them really got into a major challenge facing India before and after Modi's election, which is the poor effectiveness of government at uh, state and indeed uh, federal level. And unless they get that right, neither of them would be able to fulfill their dream. So in the book, I go through what I think it would take uh, a government to deliver. And I use examples from history, but I also use examples from every continent in uh, the contemporary world. And the first thing that governments need is uh, priorities. And one of the things that becomes very clear uh, is the skills that get you elected are absolutely not the skills required to run a country. Um, I quote Viktor Chernomyr in the Russian Prime Minister from the mid-1990s, one of the very few Russians, uh, Russian government people that ever made Russians laugh. Uh, and he says, among other things, we tried to do better, but everything turned out as usual. That was his summary uh, of being in government. Uh, he also, by the way, once said, um, we keep inventing new institutions and they all turn out to be the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Um, anyway, you've got to set priorities. You've got to learn how to, how to, how to govern uh, and priorities are a really important part of that. It's not like running a business 
uh, where if you prioritise these things, you can divest yourself of those things. You can sell them off or you can stop doing them. Governments, there's a whole lot of stuff you just have to do. Uh, Blair used to say, we've got our priorities and then there's the stuff we have to do. And one of the key things that flows through getting delivery right is sticking to your priorities, even when all this other stuff that you have to do uh, is in danger of overwhelming you and getting organised to do that. So the first thing is to set some priorities. The second thing is to organise yourself to deliver. And um, one of the uh, tensions inside a political organisation, whether you're, whether you're the Prime Minister or the President or the Governor of a state, or indeed a Minister in a big department, is there's all this stuff going on, there's the media, there's crises going on, there's things going wrong, there's a, a swathe of uh, policy debates going on at any given moment. It's very easy just to do that mill of activity, the kind of what I used to call the vortex around the Prime Minister. Uh, but if you've got your priorities, you then need some part of the organisation that is going to see through delivery on the priorities, whatever those priorities might be, uh, and not get swept up in the vortex in the day-to-day. I remember very vividly on the day of September 11th, uh, uh, 2001, walking past Blair's office and seeing this mill of people around the Prime Minister, um, media people and transport people and spies and security people and soldiers, all the kind of people that you would need in that kind of crisis. And my first instinct was to go in there and say, what can I do to help? But I didn't do that. I, I realised, it, it's kind of obvious, but it was, that, was when, that was the moment it crystallised. My job was to keep the show on the road, keep the focus on the priorities because they would have to do all that. Uh, and so that's what I did through successive crises with my team. Somebody's got to have that will to keep focused on the priorities if you're going to get things done. So that's the second thing about organisation. Um, I talk about delivery units. Um, I don't actually think they're essential, but if you get the right leadership and you get the right uh, mission and some good people in there, it's a very good way of keeping the focus. The third thing you need, having got um, priorities and strategy, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and, and organisation right, is strategy. So how are you going to do this? How are you going to go about doing this? And there's a, 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 a substantial chapter which draws a lot on uh, Gwyn's work, actually, uh, on the different ways of reforming uh, different kinds of service and what works in certain circumstances. I'm not going to go into that in the short time I've got. But basically, as a service gets better, you need to change your strategy. So if you're doing something that's awful and you want to make it adequate, you can use a kind of command and control uh, or hierarchy and targets, as Gwyn calls it. But once you get the service to a certain level, um, you can, I mean, the, the, the sentence I use is you can mandate adequacy, but you can't mandate greatness. The English language won't even let you say, I mandate greatness. It's just an impossible thing. So you can mandate adequacy, but you have to unleash greatness, and that involves uh, different forms of strategy um, and uh, I go into that but the, the, the thing I want to pull out for this moment is there's certain things whichever your strategy that government has to do and I call those things stewardship and the underlying idea is whether or not you're meeting all the, the goals that you set for yourself um, are you leaving the organisation you inherited in better shape than you found it are you strengthening the capacity of the machine whether it's number 10 Downing Street or the White House uh, or the Department for Education, uh, or the Chief Minister's office in Punjab, uh, uh, which I, I, I talk about a lot. But taking an institution and leaving it in better shape than you found it is a critical part of doing this. So organisation, priorities, organisation, strategy, and then planning, which is what uh, Joseph did so well. There are three things that really matter in planning. I quote Eisenhower, the famous quote, I've always found in, in battle that plans are useless, useless, but planning is indispensable. And the three elements of planning are setting out the actions, who's responsible, who's going to do them, when they're going to get them done by, uh, and trajectories. So how is the data going to change as you put your actions into, account, into, into action? Um, and the trajectory is a really important device. It sounds like a kind of technical thing, but what it makes you do when you're planning is think about the connection between the action and the impact. Um, and that's a very powerful uh, step that you want. Uh, we used to challenge civil servants, because in Britain they used to, uh, when we first asked for trajectory, they'd go rushing back to whichever department they came from and get out their most sophisticated analytical equipment, which is called a ruler, and then they'd draw a straight line. We didn't want straight lines, because very rarely does the world move in straight lines. So the second thing is a trajectory, the first thing is a set of actions, and the third thing is a delivery chain, exactly as Joseph put in place in the Old Testament. 
So if you get those three things, the rest of the planning falls into place. And then what you need, which is the next part of this, is some routines. Government is driven by crises and events, but it's routines that drive outcomes. We built two routines in the original um, uh, delivery, three actually, two, the two that, two that are most important. One is, on each key priority for Blair, we wrote a monthly note, like a five-page note on, is the NHS making progress towards the health goals that have been published and set? with the trajectories and a bit of text and explaining it would take Blair probably 10 minutes to read it but just in case he didn't have 10 minutes there was a one page covering note saying this is going well this is not going so well and this is what we're doing about any problem that we've identified and then it would say do you agree and he could say yes no or could they be bolder or those kind of Blairite things to write on notes we uh, Jeremy Hayward and I back then thought we'd kind of invented this monthly note process but then I read and the story is told in the book the MI5 history that Christopher Andrew wrote, the magisterial history of MI5, it's a fantastic book. In 1923, MI5 are sitting around saying, Churchill's not showing enough interest in this. And somebody says, well, maybe we could write him a monthly note. And then they say, yeah, that, that's true, we could, but Churchill's a fantastic writer, so we've got to get a really, really good person to write it, otherwise he'll never read it. Um, so they say, oh yeah, well, we've got this brilliant writer who everybody loves anyway, he's called Anthony Blunt. <laughs> Um, so they got Anthony Blunt to write the monthly note from 1943 through to 1945 and the first monthly note is in Christopher Andrew's book, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, it talks about 145 German spies, 15 have been eliminated, 20 something have been turned and so on. At the bottom of it Churchill wrote, deeply interesting. <laughs> Blair never wrote that on a single one of my monthly notes, <laughs> I'm afraid to say. However, the, the, the really amazing detail is that Anthony Blunt shared the monthly note to Churchill with Russian uh, uh, spy, uh, his Russian minders before sending it to Churchill. So Stalin knew what was in the monthly note before Churchill. That is pretty incredible. Ours, I think, as far as I know, were secure. The second routine we had was stop take meetings, which were every two months, um, which I now do with the Chief Minister of Punjab on education and health. We go every two months to Lahore and we sit and we review progress against the trajectories. All the key decision makers are in the room uh, and we address the problems that are coming up. We uh, celebrate the successes, we plan out the next two months and we just do that. We've been doing it for three or four years and we've increased enrolment in schools by two million, um, reduced uh, student dropout, increased teacher attendance, etc, etc, simply by building routines and now we're doing the same for health. We will uh, have huge impact on reducing infant mortality over the next two to three years simply by making sure the system is managed by routine. So these, stop uh, th th these are things that counteract the endless um, swirl around a leader and enable the focus on delivery. And then having done the problem solving uh, the, the, uh, in, in the meetings, you, you then need a set of techniques that help you solve those problems and the, chapter, uh, the next chapter is called problem solving. I, I, I open it with a, a description of the Russians trying to fight the Japanese in 1904 and they've just finished the Trans-Siberian Railway which is a brilliant um, engineering uh, achievement and they've got to get their, all their troops right across Siberia to fight the Japanese over there. One small thing, they haven't built a bit of railway around Lake Baikal. So they have to detrain everything at one side of Lake Baikal and then get it across the lake and put it back on the train. And their first, <coughs> their first thought is to build a railway across the ice because the, um, the, 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 the ice is still there in March and April, but it's beginning to melt and the first train actually sinks in Lake Baikal. And so they thought they can't do that. So now they're doing it on horses and carts and everything piles up in the station at Irkutsk uh, and one of the many reasons that Russia lost that war is because they had a logistical problem at Lake Baikal. So one of the things is diagnosis of what your problem is and the book gives uh, some insights into ways of diagnosing problems but if you've got your planning right and your trajectories and your routines the problems will identify themselves early generally before they become a crisis and you can solve them effectively. Um, in that uh, book written by to um, people in, uh, fr uh, from this, this university, um, the blunders of our government. One of the things they talk about is the, a deficit of deliberation in the blunders they're talking about. If you've got this stock-taking process, you address the deficit of deliberation. 
And then the last two chapters are about one irreversibility, seeing it through till it can't go back to the way it was before. Um, and this is about a legacy. It's about establishing the big change that is the change that government set out to achieve. And you might not know about your legacy till long after the event. Um, it's only as a result of uh, Gwyn's work in the last few years that you can show that on the whole the delivery approach to uh, health in England worked rather better than in Wales and Scotland. And Gwyn emailed me about a year or so ago and said actually in Scotland they've now got a delivery unit and they've caught up and it was doing delivery stuff. So you don't know at the time what your legacy is going to be. I quote the Mexi former Mexican health minister who says the way uh, they establish a, 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 a legacy in Mexico is to say my predecessor was an idiot and my successor was a traitor. Um, but if you want a legacy that goes a bit deeper than that, you have to get change seen through. You have to see through the politics of it and you have to see through the, the, the change and the embedding in the culture and the capacity of the system to keep delivering what you've done. And then the final chapter is called Other People's Money and it starts with the story of Joseph. And it's basically saying, if only we could deliver better outcomes for less cost, uh, wouldn't that make uh, everybody a lot happier? That's not to say we don't need money, and it's not necessarily an advocacy of cuts. It's about getting better results for every pound or dollar or whatever it is that you spend. And um, my thought, actually, it, for, for the current new government, and it's a kind of perfect day to be debating delivery in Britain, is that if you combined uh, the Blair second term focus on delivery of outcomes with the control of public expenditure of the Cameron first term and really connected those two things together, actually you could uh, be world leading in producing better outcomes that control cost. The election campaign largely focused on inputs, 8,000 more doctors or uh, 8 billion more money, but what now needs to happen is a focus on what are the outputs and outcomes that we're going to get for the goals, uh, for, for, the, for the money that we're going to spend. Uh, and it's going to be tough because, as everybody knows, the deficit is still big, people's willingness to pay taxes is not that great, uh, and that will require innovation. And we can talk about what that might look like. Thank you, Mara. Fantastic. Thank you so much.